Hi, I'm Rosa Eugene. Uh, this is Cal this is in Calpin, South Carolina. And today we're being interviewed by the Asheville Museum of Art uh, with Miss Kimberly Kramer. Is that correct? Uh, and um, we I guess we're being interviewed because we are in their uh, permanent collection. We have a piece of pottery called uh, Pride. It's a jug. And it's carved with some relief at the top. The top part of the piece is, is kind of relief at the top. And then you have some relief in between all the faces. Uh, this was a piece that was, what well, can I say, it was donated to the museum by um, Ted Oliver. He donated in the memory of his wife's father, who had passed away. He used to come here and buy our work and resell it in his gallery. And he was also a collector of the work. So when the, his wife's father passed, he thought about the Asheville Museum of Art and asked which piece, you know, did he, did I think, you know, would be nice for the museum to have and, and he came down and he picked the piece out. I think it was a few years after that, maybe maybe eight years after that, became, you know, gravely ill and he passed away. Now I still keep in contact with his wife. She lives where does she live now in Raleigh. She lives in Raleigh now and every Christmas she sends me a Christmas card. My husband just like he uh, he'll tell you he started we bought him the potter's wheel in 1985. He started making pots in 1986. I think you never turned on a potter's wheel before. No. He's, he had never turned on a potter's wheel before. So we bought it, but you know, from uh, uh, from an ad in the uh, Atlanta Journal, the Constitution, and under the miscellaneous section, this, this potter's wheel with all these supplies and kill and wheel and books and clay and and we went down and picked it up and put him in the garage and he taught himself how to turn pots from reading the, the different books that we had bought him but we hadn't hooked up the kill so the, the trick to that we once we build in the building next door where we started and he decided that he was going to glaze some of the stuff that he had once he fired it. So once he fired all this, all these pots, some of these pots, and he started putting glaze on them, you want me to tell the story? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> the glaze ran well, off. You're going to tell it anyway. Yeah, the, glaze ran, the glaze ran off the pottery onto the shelves, and he had to chisel all this stuff off. But see, I was working at Stove for Food, you know, as a third shift nurse, so I was nowhere around when he was, all this was ha happening to him. But then, uh, also, people want to know, well, why do you have all these carvings? You know, why is it carved? And, and why would you think to carve it and, and make all these different drawings and stuff on it? Well, my husband was the artist, number one, before he became a potter, so he did all paintings like some of them you can see over here. He did all paints, he did acrylics, ink, pencil, you name it, you know, in art, he did, he did it. But so. back, wait a minute, wait. but back to that point where we got, why the pots was, uh, had so much uh, de decorative stuff on it, because they was heavy, and that was a way to remove some of the weight from the pot. So if you carve in to the pot, you're lightening the pot up. So instead of it feeling like a brick, it went back to feeling like a piece of pottery again. Well, I was going to get to that part, you know, where you had to carve it in order to make it lighter. That's the reason why he started carving. It didn't have anything to do with he was inspired by whatever. He was just trying to make his pots lighter. Yeah, and on the glaze part, I came in, he could have been doing this as a hobby for the rest of his life we thought, but it took him six months 
to get a whole garage full of pottery. When I came home from Stouffer Food, because I worked for Stouffer Food it's, uh, five miles down the highway, I was a third shift nurse, and I would sit and talk to him about what happened, and he said, well, while you're sitting there, won't you glaze, you, you, y'all been here, so you know how you would, won't you glaze this pot? So that's what I did. I said, he said, well, uh, take this brush and just, just brush three coats on it. Just brush three coats on the pot. So I did that. I did about three or four pots, and then I went up to the house and went to sleep. So when he fired up the kill and the pots came out, I could hear this person just hollering and screaming and yelling and just hollering and screaming and yelling from this building here up to the house. And he come busting in the door, wake up, wake up, you gotta see these pots. And so I, I woke up and then he said, oh, Rosa, you should see them, they're just so beautiful. He said, what did you do? So I, I said, well, you see what I did? I just brushed them just like you said with the brush. He said, oh, it got to be a fluke. I, he said, you can't, he said, you can't do that. So what I did was, he said. I asked her to come down again and, and do three some more, more pieces. And glaze some more pieces. So when he fired next time, the pieces, they was perfect. Again. Again. So he got on his hands and knees. Trust me, this is a true story. He got on his hands and knees and he said, wow, honey, could you please glaze all my pots See, so they can be beautiful. Now why that was important is because if you turn, take that much time to turn a piece of pottery and carve on it, and carve on it you don't want to lose it because you messed up the glazing process. And once you mess up the glazing process, it's over, the piece is finished. It's just a mess. No matter what you do to it, if it don't come through that process, you, you, you're just throwing them away. So if she glaze them and can glaze them right, which I couldn't do, I don't know why I couldn't do that, but I just couldn't get that right. And she came down and she got it right. So yeah, I was on my hands and knees. <laughs> Please, baby. So, now what happened was we figured out later, I told him, I said, I'd do it. But one thing is gonna have to change. All of his pots were brown like these pots here. Every, everything was brown. If I'm gonna uh, mix a glaze, I said, I'm gonna pick the colors. So I start picking the colors and I changed the colors. So I said, we're gonna have three colors. We're gonna have blue, we're gonna have green, and then we can interchange the third color. But those colors we'll always have because people like blues and they like green. So what happened was I started uh, reading all these books. You remember them books I had bought him that go with the, uh, the, the pottery? I mean, the wheel and the kill. I started reading those books and they had all kind of recipes and everything in the book. So see, I was a nurse, so I took, what, three years of chemistry? But I had enough chemistry to know how to, you're supposed to measure. So I decided to do the glaze, but then the glazes that he did have ran onto the shelf. And once they ran onto the shelf, he would only get maybe two or three glazes out, you know, Jesus. that came out. So then he got this one beautiful glaze. I call it like a volcanic marble glaze. And it came out on this piece here. You not only have to write the amount that you put into it, you also have to write the stages because this is more than one glaze. So if you put four coats here on the, on the rim in order for it to spill like this in the center, then you have to say that on the instructions when you put down the glaze and then how many coats you put here. Even if you dip, which we don't dip, everything in here is brushed with a two inch brush. And she wants the same consistency in 85 that she get in a, in 96. So it's never mixed in a big batch. It's always mixed in a small batch for control. And control, I'm saying, when I'm saying control, I'm saying the color. Because if you mix in a large container, you'll lose consistency in an iron because one element is heavier than the other one. So it has a tendency to settle. And that's why she brushes with a two inch brush instead of dipping because everybody can't brush. And then it's another thing with brushing. You waste very little. Yeah, yeah. Or none at all. And when you dip, 
you lose a lot because at some point you're gonna wind up with just iron in the bottom and you don't know what it is if it's cobalt. It's a heavy solution, so you're gonna lose something right there. You lose a lot. Yeah, and, and it's like yeah, I think it's a hundred and something dollars a pound. That's the reason why I started glazing. But I wasn't doing any craft shows. I was just glazing and then we got a, uh, the whole studio that we had built for him. It was filled with glazed pots. I must specify this so everybody can understand. My sister, her name is Ruby Dawkins. What she did was she worked for WSPA at, uh, as a producer. What happened was she said, we do Freedom. I'm going to shoot some film for Freedom Weekend Aloft. And I, that's a balloon festival they used to have in Greenville. She said, well, why don't went to try to sell some of his pottery there? She was the one who, who suggested we do the craft show. That's how we started doing craft show. And then that, that happened and we did the craft show. And I think we made $300 in three days and I quit my job. Yeah. That was it. And then he fell in love with it. And then he realized he went around and he asked people questions, you know, like, how do you do? What do you do? How do you, you know? And then they suggested that we get the Sunshine Artist magazine. Yeah, but that wasn't, that wasn't the, the most important part. The, the important part was to realize that I had been turning pots for six months. And, he, and the guy said, you've been turning pots for six months and you made $300 and you quit your job. He said, all you made in six, in six months was $300. It wasn't just for these three days. So I said, whoops, yeah. it was too late. I, I quit my job already. <laughs> I was happy. I liked the people I was selling around at the craft shows. We was so having a good time. We decided we, you know, you know, he do craft shows and I was still working. So I had so much time because I never call in sick. You know, I had a bunch of sick days, so I would go to the craft shows with him when I could. So if one person, I found out if one person liked something somewhere and we was traveling, you could do maybe two or three because people's taste was similar in South Carolina, all the way along the coastline or all the way along the mountain ridges. So if, if a potter don't venture out and intermingle or talk to people and find out what people like the different things then you you'll get stuck on one idea your creative juices keep flowing when you're going in different places yeah and uh this piece was called picking pecan and it was hard to uh understand why a person didn't know what this was how could this be cotton or anything else but this piece did not work so this was a bad idea in 01 in 2001 and it's still a bad idea today so I'm waiting for everybody to understand what pecan look like and what it is and then we're gonna be I'll go back to making this again so I was a little bit ahead of myself on that and I got slapped in the face with a, a rejection on this piece, on this beautiful piece. Oh, well, see, first of all, I used to pick pecan for a living as a child because in Louisiana, you need it to, uh, you either have to have, catch some fish to have some meat to go with your red bean, or else you have to go out and pick some pecan so your mama could have some, a little bit of money to buy some uh, pickle meat or some uh, salted pork or what's that? Ham hocks. Bad back of ham hocks. You see what I'm saying? So picking pecan was the easy way to do it. All you have to do is find the right tree and you can make maybe $2. And, and, and back in the day, $2 was a lot. And then your family treated you nice when you can bring home, you know, a couple extra dollar to help. But it still was a bad idea picking pecan. But it's gonna, it's gonna catch on soon.
at the Florida State Fair. No, it was it was at Ponce de Leon Mall. At the mall, at one of the malls in Florida, we used to do shows. We used to do all the way down the coast of Florida. And the lady needed something comfortable because she had, uh, you know, like arthritic hands, and she needed to hold a cup. So instead of me throwing the little pieces down on the floor, I just took the handle and curved it a little bit and twisted the side. Instead of it being straight, it kind of conforms to your fingers. So when you tilt the cup, the cup almost falls towards your face. Had no idea it would work, but I see I'm gonna try it and see if she like it. And not only did she like it, everybody else did. So when I did that, that's the only handle I could put on the cup because they wouldn't buy it if it was straight. So they say that's your signature, signature handle. Did not know it was such a thing as a signature. You remember I was self-taught. They didn't say that in a book, develop something for your signature. I didn't know that. So I did that and that became a signature uh, mark for my pieces. And everybody had information that they wanted to share with you. And that's why people underestimate the customer because they swear they know more than the customer. And the customer been out here for a long time looking at everybody's work. So that's how a lot of things we do or I do got started because uh, I was taking advice from uh, everybody. I don't know whether I would say I was a Christian, Christian person, but I would have perfect attendance at Sunday school. And if you go to Sunday school every Sunday and get perfect attendance like three, four years in a row, and every time you leave the Sunday school, they sang the song. Now, I don't know whether you've seen a lot of my work, but my work goes around this one song. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a song once we sung it. It's called, Jesus Loves the Little Children. That song I sang every Sunday, I know for like four years in a row. It, it said, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red, yellow, black, and white. And on a lot of my pieces, you will see those colors, red, yellow, black, and white. But then at 12 years old, I said, you know, I'm not black. I looked at my skin, I said, my skin is not black. I said, this is brown. And then I had e an epiphany. <laughs> it's like, oh, wow. So this song is done in a church. And you're teaching these children uh, stereotypes. I mean, it, it's, it was just one of those things that I just could not get rid of. You know, but when I started making pottery, I needed to answer that question. You know, who can love all the children of the world? Because humanity today, they can't seem to answer that question. They, I don't like her because of this. Oh. Where, where these people are this and they want to do wars and kill people and kill children and kill mothers so it is somebody who can love all the children of the world no matter what color they are and the only person can do that is Jesus that's my answer to that question and I learned that in Spartanburg South Carolina at the Mount Moriah Baptist Church so the pieces that I usually do is uh, they're usually called an exercise in balance slash equal. It just impacted my life so greatly. It's dominated what I did, uh, flexibility. I have a piece called Flexibility, and it's talking about ballerinas. And then I have another piece, you know, with the, with the colors, red, yellow, black, and white. Then I have another piece that's uh, that has um, figures on it. You no, know, the scale. It has a scale made out of uh, a quilt, quilted, a quilted scale 
with beads going all the way over the top and they it's talking about women, you know, and equality for women. That song still comes in. It, it influenced, you know, just by me being born in Spartanburg. My husband believed stuff's supposed to be balanced and equal. I didn't think you can balance pottery and make it equal because it's handmade. How is it gonna be equal, you know, all the way, all sides are gonna be equal, everything's, and so I didn't believe in, I don't believe in equality because equality can exist, but it, 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 can't, it can only exist in a person and, and the supreme being like, uh, or superior being like God, because you know, we all have prejudice. Realize that, you know, equal is not a, a it's just a word that sounds good. You know, fairness. You know, if you got one kid and you buy this kid a $100 pair of tennis shoes, then don't go out and get this one uh, uh, $2.50 tennis shoes from Goodwill. What I'm saying is if you buy one something for $100, then you buy the other one something for $100. See, that's what I understand as being equal. So that's how I did the, uh, the piece with the, with the uh, exercise and balance. that question but 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 be nice okay see what happened is when you just you know I could do black people and you know and then and reminisce on who it is and who was it and who cooks good and who cooks good but as I got older I found myself around white people a lot more than black people and it was just as nice and the women was just as uh, demanding and telling you what to do. You know, it was very little difference. I know people like to think it's a big difference, but if you comfortable around a person, they'll tell you exactly what they think. And I found myself in that position around a lot of white people, men, women, and everybody. And so I said, well, I'm a, I done did a minority in relief, but they're the majority, so I just changed it, and I did white people instead of black people, and we named it majority in relief. And they said, no, you don't. No, you, do. you don't do us. And so that was another one of those things yeah. that was, I, I thought was a good idea, and they said, mm, no. They didn't like it. They did. It's not that it wasn't did tastefully. They just didn't. They just didn't want me to do them. I might do a piece with with you. You and you know you meet people. And, and he put their face because they face yeah. when they meet them they stick in his brain and he tries to get them out by carving their faces in. So I started doing faces of people that I remember. Some people cook good. Some teachers was really strict. And then some teachers was really nice. And then had some people in a neighborhood that was always asking you to do stuff. And then it was some people in a neighborhood that didn't even want you in front of their house. So it was, it's not that hard to, to do the faces and, and it repeats itself. See, pride was one of those things that I was asking my husband one day, do you think that that's something that we've, we're losing? People don't have pride like they used to. Pride in themselves, who they are, pride in their work. So then, you know, you would say, oh, wow, I would never do anything like that. I'd be ashamed of myself. But that's pride. So I told my husband, I said, I wonder could you, you know, since you do faces, I wonder could you capture that on a pot? Capture, you know, pride, people with pride for faces on a pot. And he said, well, you know, I'll try. So that's how pride came about, that these people would be proud of who they are. That they, they, they wasn't rich and they had these big, 
oh eyelashes with the long fingers or you know that kind of stuff but was they a proud of who they were and what they had and what they did and what they did and Cause most school teachers you, you know it they was the epitome of pride you know they carried yourself well they always had nice clothes on you know pride builds up and just a little bitty things that they teach you all along the way helps you feel better about yourself. So that's how the Pride Series came about. And usually when we when we do a concept, uh, the pieces are larger pieces, museum pieces, we do uh, one of those. So Pride has one piece, but it has a series. So the piece, okay. the piece that y'all have, it would have been the third step down. You have the large piece that stands this high, and then you have another piece that's, that's, that's this size. That piece can never be broken down. That's the only piece it's gonna be, because you can't, you can't even break that idea down, it's too complex. So, and that's, that's our big difference in balance. And, you know, when you're trying to balance something to accept the design, it's very difficult. It looks better and it has greater detail because her work is thicker and you can do more relief work and then it's bigger so you can paint larger figures so they're easy to be seen from across the room and it make a bold, a bold statement when she make a piece. Yeah. yeah. I say I can't draw a straight line. That's why we have bands on the top and bands on the bottom. So when I brush, I stay within that line. So that's what the band does. It frames the artwork in the center. And because I can't, my husband can do a straight line all the way around the pot. He don't need a guide. But see, since I do all the glazing, well, I don't do all the glazing, I do most of the glazing. I need a guide. So that's why it's banded on the top and the bottom. The white people that come and buy the pottery, they stand in the booth and look at the faces. And sometimes these people just burst out into tears. And so I asked them, I said, well, why are you crying? You know, and they would say, one lady said, she looks like my Nana. She raised me. She said, the picture of this woman you have on this pot is identical to the lady that raised me. She said, I loved her more than I loved my own mother. So these faces not only touched uh, African Americans, the small amount that do buy from us, but they touch white people because they can remember when African Americans worked as servants in their home, you know, or babysitters or, or, or cooks or whatever in their home and how they were treated. But also the houses did the same thing. And the barns, now they, uh, they would come up to the booth and they said, oh, you're doing my history. And one of them would say, well, what, what do you mean? No, this is my history. They would say, no, these houses, I was, I was born in a house like that. If you don't talk to people, you know, you can get people mad at you right away. And, and we say, wow, now we got to explain. It's a technique. It's not the condition that we was in. Just little bitty things that you have to communicate with people what you're doing because they'll get offended right away. You know, everybody got their uh, what you call it? Burdens to bear. Burdens to bear. We do a piece called Burdens to Bear. So it's just little bitty things you have to explain to people so they can understand and appreciate what you're doing. They don't have to buy it, but when they come to the shows and look at it, they need to understand why you did it and what it is. We started out with creation of a people. It's behind me, you can't see it now. But uh, that's when we came over on the ship. Then it's the struggle. The struggle was the stuff we had to do as, as slaves. But then as slaves, uh, what we decided to do is we was gonna show all the positive things that African-American people was doing. The reason why we survived slavery. That's what created wealth for all the plantations. Those people was just rolling in money. And it was because of slaves, they wasn't paying them anything, you see. So we said, well, th uh, that was positive. I look at it, people say, well, how did you think that that was positive? Because the Italians couldn't do it. They were dying out, falling out in the fields and stuff. And all the people they brought over, 
that wasn't black, they couldn't do it. So my ancestors, that meant my ancestors was able to withstand all the torture and all the horror that went on during slavery. And we're here today. We, we, we're doing pottery, but we're, we're trying to leave a legacy. You know, that's, that's, that's the most important thing about it. So when people buy pottery, you don't see me getting up every five minutes, oh, buy this, buy that, buy that, this will be good for you, that'll be good for you. I don't do that. I sit, I sit in my chair, they got a question, I answer it. I want them to love and appreciate the pottery. Then they'll pass it on to their children. Then their children are pass it on to their children. And then they'll so be on they Antique did. Roadshow collecting big money. <laughs> <laughs> what we decided early on was, we're out here, we got all these people, we got this big old audience. Why don't we educate people on who black people are? Well, who we are. We do stories about African Americans. That's why you see their faces on a lot of the pots. Because that pot and that pot and every pot in here is an artifact. And a lot of people don't understand that pottery is one of the number one artifacts in America. Now wood, it's gonna burn up, it's gonna dry out, it's gonna rot. Paper, you know it's gonna disintegrate. And all this other stuff, but this stuff can, it's been fired up to 2200 degrees. A volcano can go over it. The, that molds and stuff can go over it. Yeah. And, uh, no, no, you know when we was in Italy, yeah, I know. I, I got you. I got you. Pompeii. Yeah, and, the, and, and Pompeii, you know, molten stuff went over over the, uh, the ash and everything, and it survives. So we said, oh, wow, they're going to be able to dig this stuff up a thousand, two thousand years from now, and guess what? Our face is going to be on pops. They're going to know that African Americans, colored people, uh, Negroes, uh, we were here. My name is Rosa Eugene uh, from Pottery by Eugene. I just want to take the time to thank the Asheville Museum of Art for coming down here and giving us their valuable time and interviewing us for this wonderful uh, video. Uh, we've had an exceptionally uh, splendid, wonderful, time with you girls and uh, I'd like to also uh, thank you uh, and, let, and let you know how much we appreciate the fact that we're in your collection with a piece called Pride. My name is Winton Eugene. I just want to thank everybody for coming.